Well, I got involved with the invaders uh, while I was filming The Long Hot Summer, which was also an ABC show. I was going through a great period of good fortune. I did two years on General Hospital, the beginning of General Hospital, and I campaigned. I, in fact, went to my agent. I said, you know, they're auditioning everybody in town for the role of Ben Quick. I said, all of the fan magazines are saying I look like Paul Newman, who played the original role. Wonderful actor. But I said, why can't we take advantage of that? I said, you know, I've been doing everything I'm told. I've been working steadily and working hard at it. And I'm getting tired of paying for the stationery here in the office. Will somebody try to agent this thing? Why can't I get a test? Well, within four hours, Marty Baum was the man's name, famous agent. God bless him. He had a screen test for me. He said, you're right. I did this long, hot summer, which was filmed in black and white when color was making a big splash. And I thought we'd take up collections to have it developed in color. I mean, we were working outdoors. We had lot three at MGM. It was a gorgeous place. The town of Tara, all of Tara was built out there on lot three at MGM. And uh, now they kept it in black and white, and it seems to be a death knell for the show. You're going to do it in black and white. Everything else is in color. And long about episode 15, uh, my agent came to me and said, uh, Quinn Martin wants you to do a series for him. Well, Quinn Martin was a much revered producer and I had many successful shows, as you know. And uh, he said, but it's science fiction. And I said, mm, no, science fiction. I'd be, you'll have the death knell forever. You do science fiction and forever, people are going to be talking to you about aliens and flying saucers. He said, Quinn wants you. I said, well, really? It's about what, flying saucers? You're right. And I was a skeptic in those days. Didn't take long to convince me, to, but uh, uh, I met with Mr. Martin, and uh, he was so impressive. He had writers present. They were having a writer's conference, in fact, and no one had ever invited me to a writer's conference. It was awesome in those days. And they were talking about the concept, and Quinn Martin said, I don't want a lot of special effects. I don't want to. He said, this is a study in paranoia. And now he's talking to me, the actor. I, I think, okay, that I can get behind, you know, not just chase movies. But Well, the picture painted there between the writers and Quinn Martin uh, was of this wonderful adventure series and uh, with minimal Mm, silliness, because there were a few corny sci-fi shows on the air at the time. And uh, I still didn't want to really do the sci-fi thing, but uh, things got better and better, and uh, I had no al alternative. And I'm so pleased that I did, because it, uh, it was quite an adventure, and has been ever since. I committed. Quite simply, uh, uh, he's an architect who's on the road, uh, traveling from one commission to another, and uh, too tired to go on, he pulls off the road to take a nap. And suddenly, life changes completely for him. He is witness to the landing of a spacecraft. He sees beings disembarking, who look like us. And it could be a nightmare he's having. Uh, my personal feelings about UFOs, uh, let me say that I have seen them. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to accept that. Uh, the first time I witnessed a UFO, was three days before the invaders came on the air. 
1967. Driving west in the San Fernando Valley, uh, my then wife said, what is that? And I looked to the left, and there was this multicolored track going up, and then beyond the horizon, it disappeared beyond the horizon, and I said, oh, no, maybe a comet. I, I, and she said, oh, there it is again. And it was coming back on this side and changing colors and going at speeds. How can you estimate the speeds? It's a dazzling. She said, you've got, you've got to report this. And I said, oh, <laughs> you're joking. I'm going to report this. I have a show coming on about UFOs, and I'm going to report one three days before air. No, no, no. I don't think so. That would be ridiculous. Well, fortunately, on the radio, within minutes, there were people calling in, reporting the same thing we had seen. And so I was off the hook about being a self-serving TV star. But um, it was unexplained by the military. And then, of course, two days later, nobody was talking about it. Uh, but it was a spectacular display of what, aeronautics. I don't, certainly not aeronautics, but space anotics. Uh I was still a skeptic, see. In, in, in the first weeks of the show, I came on. I'm an actor, and this is something that uh, we'll um, work on. I didn't have to work long because, uh, number one, Andrew McIntyre, who was the cinematographer, uh, a wonderful man and a good friend, and his daughter worked for someone who was very well known in the field of UFOs and had made contact. Uh, anyway, Andrew and I would sit next to each other on the way to locations where we often drove for two, three hours to get out into the desert to, for these locations. And he told me stories. He was a bomber pilot during World War II, and he flew mostly over Italy. And he talked about entire formations of bombers being followed by disks, UFOs. And I said, you sure? It could have been reflections in the cockpit. I mean, those things were all glass. He said, we would radio to one another. We're on our way to a target. And all we're hearing on the radio is, what the hell is that? What's that? It's following us. It's following us. He said, formations sometimes. He said, we were being observed constantly, and we didn't know what it was. And of course, couldn't talk about it. Military secrecy. Ah, the stories were dazzling. And I'm going, hmm. So this is not so far-fetched. And he said, my son, this is not far-fetched at all. He also set the tone on, this, on the set because occasionally, not so much the actors, but a director would come in and make uh, kind of offhand comments about, you know, this is so comic booky and the... And he would say, may I speak to you for a moment? And he would take them away off stage, and we'd all wait. And the person would come back and apologize and say, I'm sorry. Mr. McIntyre said, no jokes. We all take this very seriously. And if you can't take it seriously, then maybe I'll have to tell Mr. Martin. OK. Well, that made the job a lot easier, because there were funny things that happened on the set sometimes. Um, like, <laughs> how does an alien immolate? How do you do this technologically as a filmmaker? Man, the first couple of weeks, we tried so many harebrained ideas, it seemed to me. One was you would lock off the camera as the alien fell, and then you would remove the alien, or the actor playing the alien, and then you would outline his body with gunpowder, and then light the gunpowder, roll the camera, and then you will dissolve it later. Well, they just looked so Mickey Mouse, it was silly. And if, you know, factions of the crew would stand there and giggle, 
And uh, our prop man, uh, an Anderson, I believe Ira Anderson, uh, he said, they should talk to my brothers. My brothers can do this and a snap. They can do it in no time. And uh, eventually someone listened to him because we did so many goofy things and it was eating up time. We're out there in the hot desert immolating aliens. All seemed very silly, but uh, it was required to sell the story, to make the story work. And uh, the Anderson brothers came in and uh, observed and said, well, that's fine. Uh, just lock off the camera, move the actor, and roll a little bit longer, and uh, we'll do it in the lab. You'll do it in the lab? What's this going to cost us? Now, because there was a price to each one of these methods of immolation. And he said, Some, you know, I can do it from 90 to 210 apiece. So it was like a hitman talking about what, what your contract is going to cost to kill an alien. Uh, but depending upon the difficulty in the lab and what f cinematography they had available, it might cost a little more. And they did it in the lab, and no one really knows exactly what they did, but that was the method. I had studied for years and been acting for years by then. Um, it, an actor has this challenge, especially in something that is science fictional, uh, of believing that um, he's going through this. Uh, and in, in any situation, you have to accept it. You know, you have to accept the playwright's concept and commit to it. Otherwise, nobody's going to believe it. And uh, it was a problem in my mind, uh, this idea of doing science fiction, because my concept of science fiction was always Saturday matinees when I was a child, and it was all of this shoot them up, burn them up craziness. And I guess I should thank the writers, because they made it easy to uh, commit. There were always situations that were clearly challenging uh, in that David Vincent couldn't make others believe that he had witnessed what he had. Uh, but that's a good thing. That's a good challenge for an actor is to, to have to convince others that this is happening. It's really happening. Uh, and David didn't always know to whom he was speaking. He could have been speaking to someone who was an invader because they infiltrated law, education, government, uh, science, uh, law enforcement. So it was always a challenge. And it, it's the, uh, for an actor, what's better than to portray a living nightmare? Um, often, I didn't have to work at it because the situation was so horrifying. Uh, to work at it would have made it mm, maybe not as believable. The transition from uh, uh, the previous series I was in to uh, uh, the invaders was overnight, and the preparation I had done to come into the invaders was on that, what we called a pilot episode, um, and that was daunting because it was a whole different ball game from what I had just left, and. Uh, then it started rapid fire because we, we no sooner finished what we thought was the pilot and we were committed to on air and in came the scripts and it there wasn't a, a personal bible uh, but i sure liked what they did because later on uh, david vincent's brother is introduced in fact he hasn't committed
because he thinks he's bats. Um, and that was all very interesting, and I liked that. You know, I, I was hoping they would continue more of that going into his personal life, because there are people he left behind, people for whom he had worked and designed homes, um, other relatives. Was there a, a love interest? Uh, we never got that far. And it seems by the second season they were more interested in uh, finding um, cohorts, people who had similar experiences and who were trying to team up. And I think it was too late by then for my personal Bible. I was kind of following my nose through these adventures. Uh, I like to do that with a character. I like to have a a past life that you may not know about, but it helps me. And my past life was that I was uh, an actor who was going from job to job and so pleased to be doing so. Uh, uh, and it kind of filled the... The rest was all story. It, it, you know, with a good script, you can trust it. Mostly relationships. Uh, it put me in the company of not just great artists who are behind the camera, but actors I had seen on stage as a child and uh, uh, idolized. And Burgess Meredith, man, I, I, I was a child when I saw Burgess Meredith do Tea House of the August Moon in Chicago. Uh, Ralph Bellamy was a huge movie star. Ralph Bellamy and I are having coffee. Uh, uh, a man who, um, damn, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, so much is coming back. Uh, the first suit I bought was because of the way he dressed. Uh, he, he, he was a famous actor, but he also did a cigarette commercial, a camel commercial, and he was the first soft sell commercial where he just held it up like this and took one out and put it back in his pocket, James Daly. And I adored James Daly, and I, I dre when I was a kid, I dressed in tweeds just like James. I wanted to look like James Daly. In fact, I'm sorry to admit I was smoking camels at the time, too, because he was so cool. And uh, we talked about that. <laughs> he was in one of the episodes, and uh, I said, man, you, you created a whole, not just dress style, but a lifestyle for a lot of young people. And he said, I live with that responsibility. He said, you know, I didn't want to do a commercial for cigarettes. He said, but it was what it was. And he said, I regret it now, he said, because I think of all of the young people I influenced. It's come to me. It's come back to me, uh, how I've influenced so many people. And I said, well, I forgive you, because I think you're a great man and a wonderful actor. And, uh, and, and you still dress great. I love the way. Anyway, it's a silly anecdote, but it was an interesting encounter with someone whom I looked up to. As a boy, but there were, there were so many. Ed Asner kept He'd come through, you know. That's it. That's Ed Asner. Wonderful actor. Uh, I, there are many uh, that are not just popping into my mind right now, but that made the day really short. Yeah, I don't care if it was a 17-hour day. To be in the company of people whom you admired so as a, as a boy, uh, and now there you are working. Ed Bigley, I'm not talking about Ed Bigley Jr., I'm talking about Dad, whom I saw on stage several times. Great actor. So was Ed Bigley Jr., but I know Jr. will forgive me if I give all the credit to Dad, because he was and such a marvelous man, a great wit. He just made the day fly by because he had such a good humor about him. Those were good memories, still are.
<laughs> yes, there were days we took usually seven shooting days to make a film. Uh, we didn't work Saturdays. So uh, you would overlap. An episode would end on Tuesday at 12.30, and at 12.45, it's a new show with a new group of people, a whole new story. And eventually, especially with some of those long days thrown in there, he didn't know what day it was. It was a fascinating thing to watch on the set of this show, and I've only seen it happen one other place, and that was at X-Files. When a new script came out, you didn't hear a sound on the set or on the whole soundstage because everyone in the company was going through the new script. They couldn't wait to read the next episode. And that's how it was on The Invaders. Uh, whatever the day was when a new script was available, and mind you, they changed things up till the last minute, so there were multicolored pages that indicated this was added recently, and this is a ch There'd be people off in corners. They were doing their job, yes, but every moment they could take, they were reading the next episode. And not just for preparation, they were fascinated with the stories. A man had had to be crazy, uh, and Quinn Martin always said that. You gotta be crazy to do your own stunts. What am I gonna do if you get hurt? And yet, everybody countermanded that. And I had one of the very best stuntmen, uh, Glenn Wilder. Glenn Wilder was not only a scholar at USC, he was a champion football player. He was brilliant. And he didn't follow the football career or the scholarly career because he was also an equestrian. He had a falling horse. He had a bucking horse, and uh, you stunt men out there will know what I'm talking about. You can make a fortune that way and also have a good time. Um, the horse won't fall for anyone but you. And, uh, geez, Glenn, I hope I'm not telling tales out of <laughs> school. <laughs> well, he showed up on the set one day and he was so depressed because on the invaders he would turn over cars, he would do. Ugh. Scary stuff. I mean, and stuntmen help stuntmen. It's like musicians stick together and speak the same language, and they'll be there to back them up. What a, stuntmen are the same. They look out for your good health. They want to keep you well. And they had ways of calculating how fast you should go if you're going to hit a one-wheel ramp and turn a car over to the right. And that should not exceed 60 miles an hour, please. You can always speed it up on film, but... Let's survive it, okay? And with Glenn, they'd all, you'd always see all the stuntmen going, oh, oh, gee, oh, he's doing 80. He's got to be doing 90. I mean, it was terror time. He was just a daredevil. Uh, you know, it was Quinn Martin's command. Nobody, none of the principals will do stunts because it's just ridiculous. You could get hurt and shooting stops. But then... The directors would get this wonderful stunt. I mean, Glenn would climb a chain rope in a three-story factory, and he'd get to the top and jump to the floor, and everybody would, the house would come down. Everybody there would applaud and say, how does he do it? But now the director wants a shot of you coming up the chain from that floor, and he wants to see you do the jump. And you're saying, but, 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 you've got it on film. And I was thinking, I can't do that. I can't possibly do that. It was a lot of jumping. Out. They, they want to see your face in the stunt. So the body of the stunt, thanks to the stunt man, he sells the whole gag, as they call him. And yet the director wants to get a shot of you so he can identify you in that same situation. And many of them went a little too far. And they also put you in with not other stuntmen, but usually with other actors who don't know how to pull a punch. And it gets scary, you know. You're going, this guys he's getting too close to me. And uh, accidents happen. No, but it's interesting. And 
I don't know what was going on in the, the minds of the writers, uh, but people have said to me since uh, it was a metaphor for the Cold War, wasn't it? And I plead ignorance because I said, well, that's an interesting theory, and let me think about that. It is interesting. At the time, I certainly wasn't thinking that way. Uh, I, I, I was busy getting there on time and trying to find time to sleep, but uh, there are a few analogies that others have made that uh, they speak of the government metaphor, the um, interstellar metaphor of why aren't we sharing intelligence? And I think David Vincent ran out of directions to take with the information he had. Well, I'm amazed by it, but it must have made a great impression on the, the then youngsters who are now all in their 40s and 50s uh, or more. Uh, well, that's the 40th anniversary this year, so. Hey, the kid was 10 watching the show, he's now 50. So uh, that's amazing that you know, there should be uh, a popularity. Uh, I know from, from fan response that there are a lot of people out there who not only know the show, but many things about the show. And there are people who con contact one another online who discuss aspects of the show uh, that n amazes me. Um, I could understand it in France where it's been playing over and over, but uh, in a country where it hasn't played, it's dazzling. <laughs>